from uh, Department of Pharmacology and Toxicology of Indiana University School of Medicine. Uh, Nick got his um, master's degree from uh, Veroni State University, and, and then he obtained extensive training um, in biophysics and the physiology oh, in, in, in several institutes within USSR uh, Academy of Sciences and in different aspects of mitochondrial physiology. Um, then his first uh, postdoc fellowship is in U, uh, Russia Academy of Science. And then uh, second one was uh, Dr. Uh, Martin Klinkenberg uh, at the University of Munich. And so um, uh, where he did some really important work on ANT. And then he made the uh, right decision, great decision to move to this country, first at the University of Minnesota, and then move to uh, University of Indiana. Now he is a tenured professor um, there. Um, Nick's research has been largely on mitochondrial, uh, calcium signaling, and the neuron protection. So he's very well published and funded in all those topics. Um, so today, uh, his, the, the seminar title is Mitochondrial uh, MNDA Receptor and uh, uh, Sodium Calcium Exchanger in Glutamate-Induced Calcium Dysregulation in Neurons. Right. Okay. Thank you very much for the invitation and very nice introduction. And I think I can stay here because I have another mic here. So it's my first time in this beautiful city of San Antonio. It's a wonderful place. I really enjoy my visit and all meetings with faculty. It's just outstanding. I'm completely thrilled by their studies and it's amazing doing absolutely fantastic job and I'm very happy to be here and again I'm very thankful to uh, my host for inviting me here. So today I will talk about our studies and actually it's kind of already um, a little bit in the past because now we're shifting towards a new area towards studies in Huntington disease but today I will talk about mitochondria, an MDA receptor, sodium calcium exchanger, and how these mechanisms involved in regulation of calcium in neurons exposed to glutamate. So this is, this is one of pictures of our beautiful city, city of Indianapolis, and if you ever been there, you probably can recognize this is a canal in downtown of Indianapolis. I heard that you have something like that in your downtown, so we kind of very closely related in this respect. And before I'll go into my presentation, I want to talk just a few seconds about people who contributed to these studies, these people in my lab. Some of them already left and work in different places, but I put them on this slide just to emphasize and acknowledge their contribution to this study. I also put some collaborators from our department from our school who significantly contributed. Actually, one of these guys, Dr. Hanna, he actually uh, kind of triggered some joint project, and I'll show you data from this project. And I would say I would never do this like without him and without his support and help. And this is, by the way, a view from the window of our Neuroscience Institute. We're uh, located close to downtown, and we have also very nice this train. We call it People Mover that migrates between different buildings on the campus. Sometimes it's fun to use. Sometimes it can stuck in the middle, so you can spend the rest of your day sitting and watching all these wonderful neighborhoods. So now let's talk about the uh, topic of my seminar today. And I put this very simple cartoon 
to explain a little bit because, and I have to acknowledge, I don't remember where I stole this picture, so somebody should excuse me, but this is what it is. So this picture demonstrates the major events in the synapses when action potential comes from periphery or from somewhere, from somewhere and triggers calcium influx through voltage-gated calcium channels. This induces calcium elevation that causes fusion of neurotransmitter vesicles with the presynaptic membrane, release of neurotransmitters in the synaptic cleft, and particularly glutamate that interacts with postsynaptic membrane through different receptors. And here, again, just for simplicity, and I like this picture for that, it just shows ionotropic receptors, KNA, TAMPO, and NMDA receptor. And you can see that glutamate stimulation of these receptors causes calcium and sodium influx in postsynaptic neuron. And this calcium, and I'll talk mostly about calcium in my seminar, but I will talk also a little bit about sodium. But in this picture, I want to stress uh, what happens with calcium. Calcium goes into postsynaptic neuron, and then this calcium can be either taken by mitochondria, and you can see it, sh it shows here, or it can be extruded from the cell through sodium-calcium exchange of mechanism. So for now, that's all what you need to know about this picture. Of course, it's much more complicated, but for the purpose of this seminar, I, I hope it might be enough. Now, I will talk about an MDA receptor, about sodium-calcium exchanger, and mitochondria. And of course, I'll talk about pharmacology because I am from the Department of Pharmacology, and this, this is basically what we're doing for a living. So you will have some pharmacology data and some interesting uh, information about pretty well-known drugs that apparently have some other yet unknown functions, so I'll show you data. So this is our experimental model. We use different cell cultures, and this is red culture hippocampal neurons. We usually grow cells for 12, 14 days to let them grow and form pretty uh, good connections and kind of web so that they will resemble, at least to some extent, how they organize in real life. And then we use fluorescent microscopy where we load cells with different fluorescent dyes, sometimes with two different dyes to monitor different functions. In this case, uh, we load cells with fewer 2 to follow changes in cytosolic calcium or with rhodamine 1, 2, 3 to follow changes in mitochondrial membrane potential. And these images so, uh, illustrate, and these are kind of cell color images that show change in cytosolic calcium. And you see the scale here, then rather more red color indicates high calcium. And this is the same field with membrane potential fluorescence, and you can see change in, you can, I can't see change, but uh, this change can be visualized by collecting this uh, data and plotting over time. So these graphs show a change in fluorescence, correspondingly for Fura 2 FF and for Rhodamine 1 to 3. And here I have to explain how it works. So sometimes people not quite well know these techniques and they can be confused. So you see number of gray traces, thin gray traces. Each trace represents signal from individual cell body. So this is the area where we record this signal and then we plot, construct these graphs. Now the red trace represents the average from the whole set of fig, uh, traces. So this is an average signal for this experiment. And the same about membrane potential changes. So changes in cytosolic calcium, you can see here increase in fluorescence or in the ratio of fluorescence indicates increase in calcium. 
and increase in fluorescence of radamine 1 to 3 indicates mitochondrial depolarization. So now you pretty much know everything about techniques we use for the most part of our study. And if you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer because next I'll start to talk about... You have a question, right? Yeah. So, so uh, you need fluorescence uh, during the nerve I'm sorry? Yeah. Do we? I'm sorry. I, I can't. I'm not sorry. I, I'm not sure. I understand what. Uh huh. Actually, this is what I'm, I think I understand what you're talking about. So, the Fura 2 is ratiometric dye, and this plot shows the ratio of fluorescence at, uh, at 340 versus 380. Right? This is the question. So, radamine 1 to 3 is not ratiometric dye. Here we just record fluorescence at one single wavelength, and then we normalize this fluorescence by F0. Okay? Yeah, we, we just image all calcium, and we noticed that too, and many researchers in our field also notice the same. That might indicate either high concentration of dye accumulating nucleus, or maybe even more calcium gets into the nucleus. But because it all goes uniformly all across the field, we just use all uh, surface of the cell body for our calculations, for our plotting. I also have to say that we actually do all necessary um, calculations, so we subtract background from all our measurements, so it's already processed data, and we all also can convert this data into calcium concentration, or sometimes we measure uh, sodium, we can convert into sodium concentrations using Greenkiewicz equ equation, pretty well known. You have more questions? What is your excitation wavelength for this? Excitation wavelength. Excitation is 340 and 380. Emission is three, uh, 515 in this particular case. And for radamine 1 to 3, that's excitation 488 and emission 515. It's the same. So in this way, we can uh, measure two different dyes in the same practically, not at the same time, but sequentially in very close time, okay? Yep. So, distribution of calcium in the cell? This is what you're asking, right? So the question is, what is distribution of calcium in the cell and electrical potential? You're talking about mitochondrial membrane potential, right? So this is what we're actually measuring, and this is what these graphs show. This is the change in calcium concentration, but we do not, okay. we do not, because it's not high-resolution measurement, so we cannot... Uh, take, we actually can, but that's not the case for this particular imaging. So in this case, we just take the whole cell body and we do not look at distribution of calcium within the individual cell. Dendritic or, yeah. or anything like that. However, however, if you'll remind me at the end of my lecture, I'll show you a slide which is beyond, just beyond this set of slides, where we did similar experiments with a um, neuron from adult mice, from adult mouse, and I can show you distribution of calcium 
after glutamate application. So the calcium rise starts on the perif at perif periphery and then propagates to the cell body, and we were able to catch this distribution very nicely. And I thank you for this question, but it's not what you see here. Maybe 15 seconds or so. Here you, you see, and then you see it, the thing, the distribution start to equilibrate here, along with the electrical potential. Okay. Now we start to talk already about uh, science. So we already finished with technique. I hope. So now let me tell you what we looking here, and what we can see here. So this is very typical response of neurons to application of glutamate. And the amount of concentration of glutamate is relatively low. 25 micromolar glutamate, and we discussed today, there is a literature that in cerebral spinal fluid in patients with stroke, it could be up to 10, 15 micromolar, so it's pretty close. Now, the response of uh, neurons to glutamate is very typical. And as you can see here, neurons respond to fast increase in calcium first, then this calcium increase kind of switches to the uh, change in calcium in the opposite direction, goes down, and then it goes up again. So this secondary calcium increase that leads to sustained elevation in cytosolic calcium, this is what we call delayed calcium dysregulation. And there is significant evidence indicating that this sustained calcium elevation is causally linked to neuronal death induced by glutamate. This is what we call excitotoxic neuronal death. Death because of prolonged exposure to excitatory neurotransmitter glutamate. This may be relevant to different pathologies, particularly to stroke, to ischemia, where uh, glutamate remains around cells for a prolonged time and may overactivate glutamate receptors and may cause these kind of events. Increased cytosolic calcium. And increase in cytosolic calcium coincides with <coughs> mitochondrial depolarization. You can see it here. So we are interested particularly in the question what is beyond, be, behind this secondary calcium increase? What mechanism contribute to this secondary calcium increase? And what's the role of mitochondria and other mechanisms into this uh, sustained calcium elevation? So delayed calcium dysregulation, just a little bit of information about this phenomenon. Uh, this, uh, as I already said, this phenomenon is linked to excitotoxic neuronal death. The problem is that we still don't know exact mechanism how this calcium, sustained calcium elevation occurs and what are mechanisms behind this process. One of the hypotheses posits that uh, calcium influx via NMDA receptor play a major role in calcium dysregulation in neurons exposed to glutamate. But there are some problems with this theory because, for example, uh, glutamate causes acidification. It's a pretty well-established fact. And it's also pretty well-established that acidification inhibits an MDA receptor. So there is some kind of contradiction between possible inhibition of an MDA receptor and major role in sustained calcium elevation. Besides uh, post-glutamate inhibition of calcium dysregulation with uh, NMDA uh, NMDA receptor antagonist does not reverse calcium elevation. So again, suggesting that NMDA receptor might be not alone, and there might be some other mechanisms that contribute to calcium elevation after glutamate exposure. And one possible reason for the lack of recovery after inhibition of NMDA receptors is the failure of mechanisms that extrude calcium from the cell. And that was proposed 20 years ago, and it's still very probable cause why we don't see recovery after inhibiting NMDA receptor. But it's also possible that the failure of calcium extrusion mechanism, first of all of sodium calcium exchanger, occurs because this sodium calcium exchanger can easily be 
reverse. It can easily start to work in reverse, bringing more calcium into the cell in exchange for internal sodium. However, again, the literature has very different views on this issue, and some investigators found difference, uh, found some uh, evidence for reversal of sodium calcium exchange, and some investigators disagree with this idea. So, and finally, finally, mitochondria can also contribute to calcium elevations. We can, mitochondria can accumulate calcium, especially if calcium goes high in the cell and exceeds threshold for calcium accumulation in mitochondria. Mitochondria can contribute significant role. And we already discussed today that uh, mitochondria, why mitochondria can contribute significantly is because mitochondria also have significant amounts of phosphate. And calcium phosphate can precipitate become practically inert, and mitochondria can accumulate and pick calcium up with large quantities. So mitochondrial damage, energetic failure, and inability to accumulate calcium can also contribute to calcium dysregulation induced by glutamate. So now I want to show this simple slide that illustrates the synchronous nature of changes in cytosolic calcium and mitochondrial membrane potential. Here I show just four cells, and you can see different cells with different, different traces represent different, different, uh, different traces represent different colors. And I can't find my cursor, but I think it's clear here that the increase in calcium goes very close with change with mitochondrial depolarization. So the question is whether calcium increase causes mitochondrial depolarization and failure to accumulate calcium, or mitochondrial depolarization inhibits calcium uptake and therefore contributes to calcium increase in the cytosol. So this question remains for the last, I don't know, 20 years, and people continue to work on this and give different opinions and provide different results. But I want to show today some experiments that might shed a light on this. So first of all, this figure, this is a cartoon that shows respiratory chain, complex one, two, three, four, and ATP synthase. And this is, uh, these are measurements of mitochondrial NADH. NADH is produced inside of mitochondrial TCA cycle and oxidized by complex one. Assuming that a NADH production is constant, the rate of and the level of NADH oxidation or reduction for the most part depends on the activity of electron transport chain and activity of oxidation by complex one. So Mitochondria generate membrane potential, right? It's an electrochemical gradient of protons that are extruded in complex one, three, and four. And this electrochemical gradient keeps electron flow in control. So with high membrane potential, electron flow is relatively slow. Now, how we can activate electron flow and respiration? We have to discharge electrochemical gradient of protons. So this could be done in two different ways. Either we have to activate ATP synthesis by ATP synthase that utilizes proton gradient, and in this way, proton gradient will be dissipated, and this will allow faster electron flow and faster respiration. Or we can induce any other kind of permeability of the mitochondrial membrane that will increase proton flow back into the matrix, and again, it will lead to increase in, proton, um, in electron flow, increase in respiration, increase in NADH oxidation. There is a big difference between these two mechanisms, because in the first mechanism of activation of respiration through ATP synthase and generation of ATP, it's linked to oxidative phosphorylation. The other mechanism is not. So it's what we call uncoupling in mitochondria, uncoupling of phosphorylation and oxidation. Now, this trace illustrates experiment with glutamate, and you see that glutamate produces oxidation of NADH, reflecting increased 
electron flow and increase oxidation of NADH by complex one. Then we applied oligomycin. Oligomycin inhibits ATP synthase, and this helps us to understand whether this oxidation is coupled with ATP production. So if ATP production is coupled with this oxidation, oligomycin should block ATP production, and this, cause, this should cause incre uh, inhibition of electron flow and inhibition of NADH oxidation. In other words, this trace should go up, but it doesn't. It means that this oxidation induced by glutamate in the presence of calcium leads to uncoupling of oxidation and phosphorylation mitochondria, and now this oxidation and oxidation of NADH cannot be reversed by oligomycin. And FCCP is a typical classical protonophore that uncouples mitochondria because it increases proton permeability of the membrane. It does not change anything because we're already at the bottom of NADH oxidation. However, if we inhibit respiratory chain with uh, KCN, it blocks electron transport through electron transport chain, and you can see robust reduction in NADH. Okay? Now, what happens if we will remove calcium? If we will remove calcium, we have completely different picture. We still have decrease in, uh, decrease in NADH state, and then what we have here, we have robust reduction in response to oligomycin, and then oxidation uh, induced by FCCP, and then again reduction induced by cyanide. So what it tells us that without calcium, even in the presence of glutamate, mitochondria remain coupled, and they nicely respond to inhibition of ATP synthase by increasing the concentration of reduced NADH. What it means, it means that calcium damages mitochondria. It means that calcium that goes into mitochondria uncouples oxidation and phosphorylation. So how this can happen? This is one of possible mechanisms, and the picture that I show here is Five, uh, no, it's from 2005. It's completely outdated now. We were pretty sure about this stru structure in 2005. Now, thanks to some researchers in the field, we have no idea what it is and how it works. The component, which is established pretty firmly in this structure, and it makes this force sensitive to cyclosporine A. Now, This is an experiment we did with multiple pulses of glutamate. Here we applied glutamate several times for 30 seconds, and you can see that in the control cells respond to gradual increase in cytosolic calcium and gradual mitochondrial depolarization. So in this case, glutamate activates these glutamate receptors, and these glutamate receptors actually located not only in the synapses. There are a lot of extrasynaptic receptors that can also contribute to calcium influx into neurons. So this is what happens in the control cells, and you see that pretty quickly neurons gave up and they kind of moved to the state of calcium dysregulation. And this is what happened if we will inhibit calcium, uh, inhibit mitochondrial permeability transition pore. Here you can see that now cells survive many more pulses of glutamate and mitochondrial membrane potential remains more stable, again, than lower this trace than higher membrane potential in mitochondria. And this pretty simple experiment illustrates the role of mitochondria in keeping cytosolic calcium low and also illustrates the role of permeability transition in the ability of mitochondria to accumulate calcium and inability of mitochondria to maintain normal membrane potential. Now, but uh, the ultimate test of this hypothesis about permeability transition came with, uh, with the development of uh, mice that do not have 
cyclophilin D in their mitochondria. So these mice lack cyclophilin D, and as you can see here, the Western blood with, mitochond with isolated mitochondria shows no cyclophilin D. And what's interesting, this mitochondria have significantly increased ability to accumulate calcium. They accumulate many more pulses of calcium. Now that's experiment with isolated mitochondria. And each pulse you can see here like a saw. We measure calcium in an external medium. Mitochondria accumulate rapidly calcium from external medium. And you see at some point mitochondria lose ability to accumulate calcium. And calcium just goes up. Nick, so, uh, yes. before moving on, so um, I'm still, I'm not familiar with this uh, neuronal respiration, but glutamate uh, is a neurotransmitter, right? But in the previous one, you showed it's, most, it's also a substrate for complex one respiration. But in your experiment, you put, you, you add the glutamate, you increase, stimulate the respiration. That means that the substrate for respiration is limited. So you can. Well, glutamate can play different roles. So if you apply glutamate outside of cells, it can stimulate uh, glutamate receptors, bring calcium sodium inside of the cell. Yeah. In that, inside of the cell, glutamate can work as a substrate for mitochondria. And even more, uh, glutamate can help to maintain succinate dehydrogenase in active state because if you remember, uh, Krebs cycle, there are few reactions after succinate oxidation, fumarate, malate, and then oxaloacetate. Oxaloacetate is an endogenous inhibitor of succinate dehydrogenase. So the, this situation can pretty rapidly lead to inhibition of respiration. So if you use, for example, with isolate mitochondria succinate and glutamate, what you do, you remove oxaloacetate from this system in the reaction of transamination where you combine oxaloacetate and glutamate and produce, what, alpha-catagluterate and alanine, I guess, if I remember correctly. So, but the main point that glutamate inside of the cell can serve as a substrate. It can help to keep succinate dehydrogenase and overall mitochondrial respiration active. <clears throat> An amount of and concentration of glutamate inside the cell could be five, six, up to 10 millimolar, right? So it's two different compartments, okay? But if you have one millimolar good made outside, it will lead to complete disaster, okay? Now, these uh, experiments show that mitochondria can accumulate more calcium if permeability transition is blocked. But what's important here, and what's important, and Uh, yeah, just looking at that trace there, you're showing it's cytosolic calcium levels that the cytophilin D knockout animal is better at um, reducing the cytosolic no. calcium levels. These are experiments with isolated mitochondria. Isolated, got it, thanks. But I'll show that in a couple slides, and I'll show you how it looks. So one important thing here, or maybe I'll talk about this in a second, but now I want to move to whole cell experiments, and these are neurons from the same animals, and here we just tested whether we really can see any cyclophilin D, and because these are knockouts, of course, we don't see any cyclophilin D here, and we are now convinced that these cells and mitochondria in these cells don't have cyclophilin D. Now we do experiment with cultured neurons and glutamate, and here you can see the difference between wild type and cyclophilin D knockouts. You see that cyclophilin D knockout cells have much longer duration of uh, when they can fight against calcium elevation. And the difference is obvious and also membrane potential mitochondria stays high for much longer time. But what is important here is to recognize that even without cyclophilin D, these cells and this mitochondria still can undergo calcium dysregulation and still can undergo permeability transition. So this permeability transition we sometimes call either cyclophilin D 
independent or cyclosporine A insensitive. So again, the main point is that this is not an absolute protection against glutamate-induced calcium dysregulation and against mitochondrial damage, okay? Because sometimes I read paper and sometimes people just say, okay, we had cyclosporine A, we blocked permeability transition, and these mice, these cells, this mitochondria live happy forever. That's not true. For the most part, if you keep the cyclosporine A block of permeability transition can be easily overridden by high calcium or increased duration of incubation with calcium. Okay? Any questions so far? Good. Now, we also tested whether this manipulation can increase, can improve uh, cell survival. And this experiment we did with propidium iodide and anexin 5 staining, so we can look at both necrotic and early stage of apoptosis. And you can see here that uh, uh, cells from knockout animals, this is PPIF mice, they have much less cell death following glutamate exposure. And this is just an example with cisplatin to show that we still have some annexin 5 staining, but it was not seen in these experiments because probably glutamate exposure doesn't produce any apoptotic signs at this moment. But again, one important point here is that if you look at concentration dependence, you will see that the protection with uh, cells lacking cyclophilin D is very narrow in terms of concentration of glutamates. That's around 10 micromole. If you will take high glutamate concentration, cells will die and there is no protection even though they don't have cyclophilin D in their mitochondria. Okay? So again, this protection is not absolute. It can be easily uh, or written by increased calcium or increased duration of calcium, uh, calcium incubation, calcium exposure. Yep. So in the pulsatile experiments that you did with mitochondria, what's the degradation, the, 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 the kinetics of the degradation there that you use to figure out how often to do the pulses? Degradation, you mean this? Of, of glutamate. This experiment. Well, yeah, that's one of the slides that you showed, yeah. So we and just... Now you're doing the same thing with a cell, right? These are cells, this slide, about cells. And here we just choose the frequency, and you talk about how fast, how frequently we have to apply glutamate to see these uh, transients in calcium. Just we see when calcium goes down, reaches close to resting here level, as you see here. As you see here, for example. And then we just continue to use this time between pulses. So it's... 15, 20 seconds between pulses? No, it's more than 15, 20 seconds. Probably more than that. But again, the point is we choose this timing based on the ability of cells to recover after the first pulses. Then they can, they lose this ability pretty quickly, but at that time we already kind of, okay, this is how cells respond and how they lose the ability to sequester calcium. Okay, there's no, not big science behind that. We didn't calculate kinetics of decay, whatever. It just was kind of empirical treatment. That, that when you increase the doses up to uh, 25 micromolar or whatever, then that kinetics is going to change visibly. Yeah. Moreover, and I don't have this slide here, but I can tell you... you sit down I can and actually calculate it. It's going to change visibly. Yeah, but I can tell you honestly... The cell's going to die. Exactly. And I can tell you honestly, if we did experiments with high calcium, uh, with high glutamate concentrations, and with high calcium concentrations... We could not see big difference between wild-type and mutant cells, between 
untreated cells and cells treated with inhibitor of permeability transition. Again, this uh, confirms the same that was known for decades in mitochondrial biochemistry field, that if you take more calcium, if you apply it more rapidly, and if you keep for longer with mitochondria, you can protect mitochondria against permeability transition, and you will see practically no difference between treated, untreated, wild type of mutant cells. They will go almost identical. And again, this experiment with cell death shows that if you use, for example, I think it was somewhere 50 micromolar glutamate, practically no difference between mutant cells and wild type cells. They both died pretty well and with the same pace. Okay? Now, the summary. First summary is inhibition of permeability transition, defers calcium dysregulation, and protects against neuronal death, increases neuronal survival. So, but again, the caveat here that it works on the, in the narrow range of glutamate concentration, in the narrow range of times of calcium or glutamate exposure, so that should be kept in mind and it's not the absolute protection against calcium dysregulation and neuronal death. Now we'll talk about a little bit different story. We'll talk about the role of NMD receptor and sodium calcium exchanger. And again, I just show this picture to remind you two major player, players in this game. So we did some experiments with glutamate-induced calcium dysregulation and we wanted to know what the mechanism behind secondary calcium increase. And as I already told you, NMDA receptor is believed to be one of the major mechanisms that brings calcium into the cell under these conditions. So we applied NMDA receptor antagonist MK801 90 seconds after glutamate application, and it completely blocked calcium dysregulation, as you can see here. We did the same experiment with nemantine, and we got very similar result. Nemantine also completely blocked calcium dysregulation used by glutamate. And then my student found AP5, another uh, antagonist of an MD receptor, just another bottle on the shelf. And he decided, okay, let's just finish it with AP5, and okay, and forget it. And then suddenly we got this. With AP5, we didn't have inhibition of calcium dysregulation. And in these experiments, and you'll see quite a lot of these graphs, we measured area under the curve as a measure of calcium elevation over time, just for quantitation of this data. And again, the main point here that two NMD receptor antagonists completely prevented calcium dysregulation, while AP5 did not. So what's going on? So we spent some time just looking at activity, uh, if, if efficacy of this antagonist, and I found that all these antagonists work very well, and they're very potent and efficacious. So we use double pulse of NMDA. First pulse produces rapid calcium increase, but these pulses of NMDA were very short, and after removal of NMDA, calcium comes back to near resting level, and then after a while, we add second pulse of NMDA and have almost identical calcium elevation. In about two minutes before second pulse, we applied different antagonists and we got concentration dependence, and all three NMDA receptor antagonists worked very, very well. We did also electrophysiology experiments and found indeed all three inhibit NMDA-induced ion currents very well, AP5, MK, and Mementine, no problem with that. But still, AP5 was ineffective in preventing second, secondary calcium elevation. So what and why, why we don't see inhibition with AP5? So one possibility is that in addition to calcium dysregulation, we have changes in other parameters in the cell. One of those parameters is intracellular sodium. 
And here you see experiments where we measured simultaneously cytosolic calcium and cytosolic sodium. And you see that all that uh, MK81 and memantine prevent calcium disregulation, while AP5 does not. But none of these inhibitors or these antagonists can actually prevent sodium increase. So sodium remains high even in the presence of these antagonists. So now we have another factor, increased cytosolic sodium. In addition, we have plasma membrane depolarization, and we measured membrane potential with this fluorescent dye. First, we tested different KCL concentrations applied outside of the cell to depolarize plasma membrane, and we saw very nice decrease in fluorescence of this dye, indicating plasma membrane depolarization. Glutamate-induced depolarization, which was not sensitive to NMD receptor antagonists. And again, now we have two factors. We have increased sodium and increased and, uh, and plasma membrane depolarization. So what it means for cells? In fact, these are optimal conditions for reversal of sodium calcium exchanger. Now, with plasma membrane depolarization and sodium increase, instead of bringing calcium in, in bringing calcium out, sodium calcium exchanger brings calcium in. So, our hypothesis was that maybe MK and memantine, in addition to NMD receptor, inhibit reverse NCX, while AP5 does not, and therefore, this makes difference when we're trying to inhibit secondary calcium increase with these NMD receptor antagonists. How we can test this hypothesis? We can reverse sodium calcium exchanger just by replacing external sodium for N-methyl D-glucamine. It's a bulk cation, organic cation that cannot be transported by sodium calcium exchanger. And this replaces sodium in the uh, external medium and reverses sodium gradient. Now, in response to sodium NMD replacement, we see significant calcium increase, and this increases, for the most part, due to reverse sodium calcium exchanger. With both MK and memantine, we found complete inhibition of this activity. Both antagonists completely block so, uh, NMDG-induced calcium increase, but AP5 was not effective. So this confirmed our hypothesis that MK and memantine can inhibit reverse sodium calcium exchanger while AP5 does not. So what it means for calcium dysregulation induced by glutamate? If the difference only in the ability of some antagonists to block both pathways, NMD receptor and sodium calcium exchanger, then if we will use AP5 that doesn't inhibit sodium calcium exchanger, but at the same time we use inhibitor of NCX, then we might have inhibition of glutamate-induced calcium dysregulation. So here we use KBR7943, very dirty drug, but in our hands it was the best inhibitor of reverse NCX, that's why we use it. And with this drug we didn't see significant inhibition of reverse of uh, calcium dysregulation. AP5 was also ineffective, as I already told you. But if we apply them together, they block completely calcium dysregulation induced by glutamate. Again, suggesting that both mechanisms are important and both mechanisms should be inhibited to prevent calcium dysregulation. So this is the summary for this part of the talk, and I don't have too much time, but I'll try to Okay. Uh, in, in your green trace of sodium levels, I thought the sodium level was unaffected by AP5. Yes, it was. Now, AP5, let, I think I understand what you're trying to ask. To ask. So how AP5 can block here if it doesn't block sodium increase? And it doesn't, it doesn't need to block sodium increase because in this case, KBR inhibits reverse NCX. So KBR is inhibitor of reverse sodium calcium exchanger. AP5 is antagonist of NMDA receptor. If you put them both together, 
you block both pathways, and this prevents calcium increase, even though sodium remains high and maybe even membrane potential remains depolarized. But both pathways now inhibited. That's why there is no calcium dysregulation. Does that answer your question? Okay. Now, now I'll try to run pretty quickly. This is the last part of my talk. So when we were doing these experiments, my colleague Rajesh Khanna came to me and asked, could you help us with calcium measurements? We have very interesting protein, very interesting peptide. And this peptide is a, uh, developed as a fragment of this protein called collapsing response mediator protein, mediator protein 2. This protein is involved in axon outgrowth and axon guidance, many different functions, and every day new functions become evident. So he was very interested in this protein, particularly in the context of uh, nociception. He was in pain involved in pain research and so on. So he designed this peptide, 15 amino acids, call it uh, because it was calcium binding domain 3, this part of this protein. So he said, okay, let's just try and see how this peptide affects calcium influx via voltage-gated calcium channels because they're important in nociception, in transduction of painful stimuli. And we did these experiments and found that this peptide very nicely inhibit uh, calcium influx through voltage-gated calcium channels. And this further was confirmed in different ways. We also found that actually CRIMP2 physically interacts with voltage-gated calcium channel, this isophore, and this peptide probably by competing with CRIMP2 and disrupts, disrupts this interaction between CRIMP2 and voltage-gated calcium channel, and the branch developed whole theory how it might work and what it does and how it um, affects nociception in animals treated with this peptide. It was published in Nature Medicine, so we did a very small part, but I, I think it was an important part because it triggers the whole chain of further experiments. But our main interest was a little bit in different directions, so we were interested in how this, whether this peptide could be useful in our experience, whether it could help to prevent cell death, whether it could help to attenuate calcium dysregulation, and so on. So what we did, we again looked at our model where we treat hippocampal neurons with glutamate, and you already saw this picture, but now we start to incubate cells before glutamate with either vehicle or with peptide, and this peptide now was conjugated with TAT, that allowed penetration of peptide through the membrane. It could allow delivery of this peptide inside of the cell. And this is what we found, that this peptide was very effective in inhibiting delayed calcium dysregulation. Peptide without TAT was practically ineffective, suggesting that this peptide works from inside of the cell, not from outside. It's probably hard to see here. Oh, no, it's probably, you can see here red dots. And what this slide shows that this peptide also protected neurons against excitotoxic cell death. And where we applied glutamate with this peptide, many more cells survived. Well, I didn't do anything. I don't know what happened. So anyway. Oh, okay. So anyway, the take home message that this peptide not only protected against calcium dysregulation, it also protected against cell death. And then we did the series of experiments where we tried to understand how it works. So now I have another hour. Lights on. <laughs> okay. So we used again this couple pulses of NMDA. Of NMDA. The AP5 completely blocks NMDA signal, as you see here, but it can be easily washed out, and next pulse of NMDA again produces very nice calcium increases. When we applied this peptide, NMDA receptor was strongly inhibited, and this inhibition persisted even after removal of TAT-CBD3, probably because it's already 
came into the cell was very nice. And again, CBD3 without that working just from outside was ineffective. Now, we have inhibition of an MD receptor with this peptide. According to our hypothesis, well, I just told you about MK801, Nimitin, and AP5. According to our hypothesis, the protective effect should be due to inhibition of both, an MD receptor and NCX. So the next experiment was with, oh, before that, before that we wanted to look at mechanism, how fat CBD3 affects an MDA receptor. And what we found that actually CRIMP physically interacts with NR2B containing MDA receptor. And this peptide, TAT CBD3, disrupts this interaction. We also thought that maybe this leads to internalization or decreased surface expression of an MDA receptor. So we did, electro, uh, we did immunocytochemistry followed by confocal microscopy, trying to find any redistribution, and we couldn't find any redistribution of this uh, NMD receptor. So we still don't know exactly how uh, disruption of CRIMP2 and NMD receptor complex affects this NMD receptor activity. So next, we tested this peptide in the experiments with reverse NCX. And is, as you can see here, this peptide was very nice and very effective in inhibiting reverse NCX. So our prediction that if we see inhibition of reverse, uh, if, we ha if we see inhibition of glutamate-induced calcium dysregulation, with high probability, this drug, this inhibitor should affect both NMD receptor and reverse sodium calcium exchanger. So now we have additional support to this hypothesis and if we use scramble peptide or peptide lacking that, we have no effect, again, confirming that works from inside, and this is specific for TAT CBD3. And by the way, we also used another form of this peptide with some single point mutation that appears to be more effective in pain research, so we tested and we found that it actually was working very well in our experiments too. Next, we used electrophysiology, and using electrophysiology, we also found that TAT CBD3 very nicely inhibits electrical ion currents generated by reverse NCX. I won't go into details. This method is widely used in studies with cardiomyocytes, and people developed this approach many years ago, so we just took this and applied to neurons, and we found additional evidence that TAT CBD3 inhibits reverse NCX, while TAT scramble does not. And nickel is dirty, it's kind of, it's not selective, but it's also used to demonstrate inhibition of reverse NCX in these kind of experiments. Now, next, and I have just a few slides, and I'll finish very quickly. Now, we also asked the question whether we can find physical interaction between CRIMP2 and NCX. And indeed, we found that NCX, at least NCX3, physically interacts with CRIMP2, and if we treat cells with TAT CBD3, surprisingly, we found increase in precipitation, suggesting that we have increased or strengthened interaction between CRIMP2 and NCX. And by the way, NCX1, there are different isoforms, NCX1, 2, 3, major isoforms of sodium calcium exchanger, with NCX1 antibodies, we couldn't find any interactions. So this is, at least for now, we believe it's predominantly related to NCX3 as a form. And next, next we looked at uh, distribution of NCX3. And with NCX3, we found that actually it sits mostly in the membrane. And you can see here this profile across this line. It nicely shows increased amount of this protein in the membranes. When we treat cells with TAT CBD3, we found redistribution of NCX3. It looks like internalization. It comes and goes in, inside of the cell. And then we treat cells with crumble peptide. Again, we don't see any significant redistribution. So now we have very interesting phenomenon. We have internalization of NCX from the surface 
And this suggests that we probably should have not only inhibition of reverse NCX, but we should probably have inhibition of forward mode of NCX, right? Because it doesn't matter for NCX. If it goes inside of the cell, both modes should be inhibited. So how we can test this? And actually, it was very, uh, very interesting experiment. We first wanted to know how we actually can test forward mode of NCX. What we did, we blocked an MDA receptor. We didn't want contribution of an MDA receptor in calcium signaling in this situation, but we applied calcium INF4 ionomycin. And with ionomycin, we had calcium dysregulation in about 35, 40 minutes after application of ionomycin. It was low concentration. I think it was something around 0.5, 1 micromole ionomycin. Now, if we block, if we inhibit forward mode of NCX by replacing external sodium for NMDG, in this case, what and why we did this, we wanted to prevent calcium extrusion by sodium-calcium exchanger. Sodium-calcium exchanger cannot transport NMDG. And if we don't have any sodium outside, this mechanism should be silent. It should not work. And look what happened. With sodium and MDG replacement, ionomycin causes practically immediate calcium dysregulation. So now we have pretty big scale from immediate calcium dysregulation to calcium dysregulation that happen, happens 40 minutes after ionomycin application. And this is what TAT-CBD3 does. We didn't expect from the beginning that TAT-CBD3 will do this with cultured neurons, but this is what we found, that TAT-CBD3 indeed inhibits both forward and reverse mode of NCX, and this very nicely correlates with redistribution and decrease in surface expression of NCX in the, membrane, in the plasma membrane of neurons. So now what we have, this is our model, and this model is still not complete, but we trying to kind of put together all what we know about CRIMP2 and TAT-CBD3. So we believe that CRIMP2 interacts physically with all three voltage-gated calcium channels, sodium calcium exchanger, actually sodium calcium, and NMDA receptor, okay? And then TAT-CBD3, which is a part of CRIMP2, can substitute or can compete and replace CRIMP2 from the complex with voltage-gated calcium channels. And this causes internalization. I didn't show this data to you, but it, were, it has been done by Raj Hanna. And it also shows that voltage-gated calcium channels go inside of the cell, and this probably underlies decrease in the activity of these channels. Uh, with an MDA receptor, STAT-CBD3 also replaces CRIMP2, but it doesn't cause redistribution of an MDA receptor from plasma membrane. However, it definitely causes inhibition of an MDA receptor by different, probably, me mechanisms. So it's something we still don't know exactly how it works. And now we have extra amount of CRIMP2, and probably it can interact either with a larger number of sodium calcium exchangers, or maybe it binds to great extent to the same molecule. So instead of one, we have a complex with two CRIMP molecules, and this causes internalization of NCX and inhibition of NCX activity. So this is basically where we are now, and we continue this uh, study. And just final slide, I just want to show that our colleagues from neurosurgery department use this peptide in the experiments with middle cerebral artery occlusion, and they found that it's actually quite protective, either applied before occlusion or even 15 minutes before the end of occlusion. So the, in, the last, in the later case, it was not as effective as in the pretreatment, but it worked very well. And now these, our colleagues, they trying to explore more and more whether it could have some translational potential. So 
This are a summary for this part. Film 2 interacts with voltage-gate calcium channels and the receptor sodium calcium uh, exchanger. Peptide diminishes calcium entry through all these mechanisms. And CBD3 antagon antagonizes glutamate-induced delay calcium dysregulation and also protects against neuronal death and could be helpful and diminishes ischemic brain damage induced by occlusion of artery in brain. So thank you very much, and I'm sorry for uh, taking a little bit more time than I should. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so I have many more slides, so if you want, I can show you more. So this is, this is the place where we work. It's our building.